Morning, everybody. Today, I want to talk to you about the 99 and the 1. You probably know this story, but before we can dig into it, let's start with a thought experiment. I'm going to take about three passes through this, and I want you to see what you think about the different folks in it as we go through it, okay? So, first pass picture in your head a crowd, 100 people, okay? Now, imagine one of them wanders off. You got the guy there, don't know him, don't know much about him. He heads off. What's your thought about that? Do we care? Do we think much about it? Not much, right? We don't know the guy. He's a nameless, faceless person. We don't even check what's up out there. If his head's somewhere good, somewhere bad, don't know, don't really care. Now, keep that group of folks in your head. And imagine this. This is Gary. Gary is your kid. Whether you're young or old, imagine thought experiment here for a second. This is your kid. And in that crowd, your kid wanders off. What do you do? How do you treat that? Do you wonder where they're going? Do you check what's out there? So, how much do we care about Carrie just knowing that it's our kid? A lot, right? Now, imagine this. Where Carrie's headed has a mountain line. We all know about those out here, right? A little bitty kid, he's going to be a, he's going to be a snack. <laughs> That's not going to be good. So now we've got Carrie heading off, and Carrie's heading into a mountain line again. So, this is the scene. Now, compare that to what you did in the first one. The nameless guy that wandered off the screen, didn't know, didn't care we go to. Little Carrie, we got a little bit different. I bet, I'd be willing to bet that not one of us would be sitting here going, yeah, it's okay, let's see what happens. We'd be up and at him going out there and finding Carrie, right? As a parent, we'd be out there, we'd be hollering, going, where are you at? Carrie! We'd be going to find out where this was, little girl was and making sure she made it back safe, right? Now, let's take a third pass of this. So imagine that crowd's no longer a faceless crowd. Imagine that crowd is a crowd of nothing but Carries, Kennys, all your kids, all kids to be. And they're all yours. But little Carrie, <laughs> off she goes. What do you do? You've got your whole group of folks right there, and you got little Carrie going off. Which one do you stay with? Where do you go to? How do you make sure it comes about? So, first pass, we got a stranger wandering off. Second pass, we got a Carrie wandering off. Third pass, Carrie's going off, along with other kids. Now, let's take this third pass and strip it up. What if little Carrie was a brat? What if she was the most annoying little girl you ever saw in your life? You just, <laughs> what do you do? Do you go, I wonder if the mountain lines would be okay. It'll be all right. I got 99 here. I'm good. Does it work that way? And if it does, what do those 99 kids think of you at that point if you don't go get the little girl? How does that work? So, if that little tour was troubling you, never behaving, always get in trouble, you know, you should pretend you don't notice. If you don't go out and do something, what happens? And if you flip this, what if you're one of those little kids? What do you want that person to do? Even if it's a little carrier, a little Denise the Menace, how do you want that person to go look? Because if you got out there in trouble and you had something going on, maybe if we were a little bit annoying, would we still want to be valued? Someone come looking for us. So, these are the three passes with the little altars. Remember how you feel about little Carrie, little Denise the Menace, and the crowd. Keep that in your head to go through this. Imagine, so, imagine you were Carrie. 
Turn to Luke 15. Luke 15, 1 through 7. This is where the phrase the 99 and 1 comes from. And so, Luke 15, 1 through 7 reads like this. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him, to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, And when he says he, this is Jesus. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness, and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he set, lays, hold, lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me! I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. Now, if anybody knows how that reads, when the first time I read this, I thought, that's weird, right? Why would you rejoice over this one when you got 99 good ones? And is God saying we should go out and get lost so we can come back and have a party? I mean, it seems like a pretty good reward to hear. But I don't think that's what God's saying, right? Has anyone ever raised animals or dealt with a group of animals? Or even a little group of kids? How does it work? If you've got a group of animals out there and you're training them and they're working, how often do they all stay around? How you train dogs? How often do those dogs, when they're first being trained, do they stay put where you want them to be? Not very much the first time, right? <laughs> they get hungry, they get curious, they want to go out there and they want to see something. You know, they want to see this. Sometimes they're not, they're not. And then, you ever take a group of kids on a field trip? Even the most well behaved kids in the whole world, and they're, they're all trained good, how often is it easy for them to get distracted, get excited? Get up, you know, going, oh, hey, what's over here? Shiny. And before you know, one's gone, two's gone. you got to go back and look, round them all up, right? It happens. And me and Jean, we got three great kids. I'm really proud of them. And I can tell you, there's been many times we go to a store, one will disappear. They'll be in this clothes rack, down the next aisle, going to look off at something else. It happens. The one thing that becomes very apparent after these experiences are either animals or humans, it isn't that it's a good behavior to wander off. It's simply a fact of life. It's going to happen, either intentionally or unintentionally. The situation that's being written about is certainly human or animal behavior, given enough time. In life, also, figuratively, do we not all tend to wander off? It happens. We all veered away from one point or another, gotten off the path of doing what was, was right at some point in our lives. We've all went off, not been perfect, we've all sinned. That's the way it is. In the story about the 99, and the one isn't encouraging one and all, but it can be a celebration. It's recognizing the fact that we're all are part of that 99, and that we're all going to wander off at some point. We're all going to get in trouble at some point in our lives. We are not perfect. We know this. I know this very well. But why did Jesus tell the story? What was the point of it? Did you ever notice who the audience is? In the audience, in verse 1 and 3, through 3, then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him and hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So Jesus spoke the parable of them today. Notice that. Now the Pharisee, did you ever study what the Pharisees mean, what the word Pharisee means? It basically means the set apart ones. And essentially, it's like a, a different way of saying the holy ones. This is the holy rollers of that generation. Now, they're just calling themselves holy. But we all know from Matthew 23, there's like a whole list of, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. And they weren't exactly doing what was right, right? Over and over. Woe to you, fries and Pharisees. Woe to you, should. Even to the point of calling them hypocrites and worse. These are supposed to be the saints. But they'd wandered far off the path. And the other group, the tax collectors and sinners, 
Well, the fact that the tax collectors are grouped together for the group called Sinners that just went late shows you the, the esteem that people held of tax collectors. These are the guys that stood along the highway and charged you what the government wanted, plus what they wanted to have on top of that. Early form of highway robbery. Both these groups, the folks that are supposed to be the saints, and the folks that had no sense of that, they both were off the path. Jesus was talking to the whole group and to us. We're all the 99. We're all the one that wonders all. We are the folks in the crowd, and at the same time, the one that gets separated from the crowd. This is one thing that I found fascinating about God. Because you think about it, 99 is a big crowd. You look around this room, there's got a decent amount of people here. We've got some more folks in line. How do you treat every single person? with the same esteem, the same respect, the same way. There are so very many, many people walking this earth. If I was God, I'd be short shirt than things. Lumping people together, grouping them there, just trying to make it easy, trying to make it so I could deal with things. But do we ever find an instance where God does that? Do we, in our relationship with God, is it as a group, or is it very personal as an individual? Let's look at what the Bible says. And let's start way back at the beginning. Turn to Genesis 3. And this is one of the first dialogues you've got between God and human. Genesis 3, verses 9 through 10. It reads, And the Lord God called to Adam and said, Where are you? So he said, This is Adam. I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid myself. Notice that. Where are you? I heard your voice. I was afraid. I was naked. I hid myself. Even from the very beginning, the relationship to God is one on one, direct. When you go to heaven, you don't go as a group, you go individually, right? The language used shows us clearly. God talks to Adam, Adam responds in the first person. Whenever God is talking to us, it's a personal conversation. God talks to us, to you, to me. I have to respond for what I have done. Now, this is the very beginning of the Bible. But it carry through to the end. Well, let's see. Turn to the last book. The very last book of the Bible. On some Bibles, the very last page. Revelation 22 and 12. In this... In the very last, the closing scenes of the Bible, this is how it reads. Revelation 22 and 12. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give you every one according to his work. Notice that. The voice of God is singular. I am coming quickly. The audience is also singular. To every one according to his work. Our relationship with God is always a very personal, one-to-one -one relationship. We come here as a group to worship, but we know God individually. And that's how it has to be. No matter how many people there are in the crowd, no matter how anonymous, lonely, separated, on our own we feel, we never are. We never really are. And that's why this morning the scripture reading, Psalm 139 was chosen. Psalm 139 is a beautiful psalm. We won't read it all the way through. We already had it read. And I thank you very much for reading it earlier. But let's turn to the beginning of it. And here's a challenge for you when you go home. Read Psalm 139 as if it's you speaking. It's your personal statement. You're reading it. You see how it feels. In just the first four verses, you can get a sense of this. Psalm 139, 1 through 4. Oh, Lord. You have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought far off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. And you're acquainted with all my ways. But there is not a word on my tongue. But behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. We are never just a sheep in a crowd to God. God knows all there is to know about us from A to Z. 
as good and as scary as that is. <laughs> but the really cool part about this is down in verse 17. Let's read verse 17 and 18. Psalm 139, 17 and 18. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Notice that. We know ourselves, right? We know the good, the bad, the good, the bad, and the ugly of everybody. We know ourselves. God knows it too, intimately. And yet, look at the love that He has for us. The extreme amount of care that He has for every single one of us. Now think about that. There are seven billion people on this earth. God knows this about every single one of us. Yeah. Then we have a relationship with God that can be so personal. God knows all about us. He treats us as us, a unique individual who he has time and affection for. God's an awesome parent. The trip to the verse we read in the scene is that every single individual in that fold is precious to God. God is not willing for even one to get lost because he knows and cares about every single one of them. Celebration is due to that. How precious each and every one of those is. It has nothing to do with diminishing the ones that are still there. The ones that are still there have all been the wonder at some point. They've all wandered off. They've all come back. And you know what? We know ourselves, right? We're likely to wander off again in the future. <laughs> it's going to happen. Now, as I was on the screen earlier, what would the rest of the crowd think if we didn't go after one of our kids? And we turned away and said, Ah, oh, well, we'll see how the mountain, they fare with the mountain lion. The rest of the kids in that crowd should be freaking out at that moment because they know that they could be that kid that wandered off too. And look at the scene. The man is not nameless. They're not faceless to God. God speaks all incredibly well. And God didn't go after the one who wanted away, even if they were annoying. What would he say to the ones who weren't wanted off that moment? How would we feel about God if we know God didn't go after somebody like that? How would we trust him? And would we trust him as much? What if we wandered off? We know we are. What if we were annoying to God? What if we got into a mess and needed God? If God was up to someone who's constantly a mess, he can be sure to come after us. That's as much gusto as he does for somebody else. Man, the truth is, kind of simple. How we treat the one is how we treat the 99. We're supposed to pattern our relationship after God, right? As a church, as individuals, that's how we're supposed to treat everybody. God sees us each and cherishes each, each of us. We should try to do the same thing for everyone that we need. As in all things, we've got to be acting an example of God. In your marriage, those that are married, if you treat your spouse just like somebody else in the crowd, how long would that work? One of the quickest marriages in the world, right? <laughs> it doesn't work. If your marriage is going to last, you have to recognize who the present person is. Know them deeply. Love them for all they are and who they are. It's the only way it happens. And what about your kids? If your family, if you treat your kids just like each other, for those that had kids, does that work? Has anybody ever had well, I'll tell you a story from my life. Didn't know about parenting when I got we had kids. Trying to learn, but I thought, okay, we've had one, we got it down, ready for the next one. We're good. We got we know what works, we know what doesn't work, Let's see what happens. Nothing. <laughs> well, what I mean by that is the things we learned for the first one did not work for the second one. But they did not work for the third one. Our kids were very different. Sometimes extremely different. They don't came for me and Jeannie. They all have the same base. 
but they were so different from each other. But it's, it's also and hard at the same time. But that's how you got to deal with things. Now, you know this time, right? The one's right outside. What about us here? We have a group of people here, some online, some traveling, some that haven't been in a while, some of us that just don't know each other. We treat similarly everybody the same way. We adopt the, the widgets are us attitude. Well, has anybody ever tried one size fits all clothing? It doesn't fit very well, right? <laughs> it's even worse with humans. It doesn't work. So, with a side note for a moment. We're split a little bit right now. It's an awkward state. We went from a pandemic when everyone was online, where now we got some online and some here. How do we deal with that? It's kind of weird, right? If we split between the building folks and online folks, how long will we last as a strong church? We've got to find a way to make things work, right? We may not know that way. But the things we do know. We made it through the pandemic. It shut down near the whole world. But here we are. We're still strong. We're still going because of God. If I can find a way for us to make it do that, we'll find us a way for us to make it do whatever comes with it. We know there will be a way to work. We may not know it yet, but we'll figure it out. We're coming back to the topic at hand. With each of us, we like different things. We got different likes, dislikes, things we do good at, different personalities. That's what makes us strong, because we can complement each other when we work together. Now, what about when we go out to the community? Those who don't know it, the same holds true. The topic we want to talk about is something that's really deep, really personal, and serious topic. It's really risky to talk to a stranger about something like that, right? But you gotta get to know the people. Way back before the pandemic, I've used this code before, but it's still impressive to me. When they were out here flashing up flyers, and I got a chance to walk around with Charles. And it was amazing because you would start a conversation with anybody. And before long, he'd know about them, you know what they're doing, what you know, what's going on, and he'd strike up and they were they were talking with him. The conversation. It's amazing because he treats every one of them differently. There's no conversation that was the same. It wasn't a script. He was actually trying to get to know every one of them. And that's an awful skill. And I hope one day to learn. But that's the way it has to be. Every conversation has to be unique. And the trick is relationships are always between individuals. Treat everyone as unique individuals with their own quirks and all their lives. That 99 is 99 individuals. This group here, this however many group we've got here, is all individuals. There's so intimate relationships like the marriage, the conversation you have with person meet, the only way for them to work is back to God. Everyone's unique. Respect them for who they are. That's how you get to know As we leave here today, try one more experiment. Look how people interact with each other. Now, do you find somebody that goes to the corner and starts sprouting out? Today, the train boarding at 12 a.m., moving to Seattle at 4 a.m.? If you got a PA system, public address, who's going to pay attention to that person? Does anybody do that? No, we hope not, right? Treat them like a crazy person. Broadcasting out in the ether is not a conversation. It's an announcement. And when you're, for those who can remember being in an airport or a train station, whenever that PA system came on, does anybody pay attention to those PA systems other than saying, does this affect me? As soon as you know it doesn't, back to your paper, back to whatever you're reading, right? The public addresses don't really help. They don't really work. I believe in a day. Watch what everybody does. Even when people grow up in groups, there's still a one to one conversation. There's still individuals in that conversation. Everybody's making eye contact, looking at each other. We do it naturally because we know each other. We're a family. But I just want to bring this to the attention that what we do so naturally because we know each other is exactly right. And that's how we got to treat the 
folks who are bringing them in. So, what individuals do you speak to? Them? And how do you treat individuals as one? And how do you treat them as another? If we have a group and we don't like one person, and we treat that one person badly. Does everyone else notice that? Does everyone else take it in, pay attention to that? They do, right? Especially as a family, as a church. How we treat one is how you treat them all. Because we look at what's going on. We look at what's happening. And we see, it's like, hey, what happened to that person could happen to me, right? So, in your family, in your work, as a church, in the community, the truth that God teaches us is really the key to it all. It's how we deal with the people that we meet. We treat them individually, we look at them, and we get to know them. I know you know all this, and this is a very simple and easy message. But as we start going back out in the community, and as we start coming back online and in the building, Thought it'd be a good reminder just to say, hey, remind us of the things we're good at and build it up. And that is the very short lesson that we have here this morning. And so, for those of you that want to start direct, start helping God direct, and have that one to one relationship with God, there's never a better time than right now. If you have anything that you want to bring for the congregation, any prayers, anything that you need, but you need to be known, it's always a good time to let us know. And so, if there's anything you can do, if there's anybody who'd like to be baptized and join God's family, let us know as we stand and we sing.